reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, Now, Israel, hear the statutes and decrees which I am teaching you to observe, that you may live and may enter in and take possession of the land, which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. In your observance of the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I enjoin upon you. You shall not add to what I command you, nor subtract from it. Observe them carefully, for thus will you give evidence of your wisdom and intelligence to the nations, who will hear of these statutes and say, this great nation is truly a wise and intelligent people. For what great nation is there that has God so close to it as the Lord our God is to us, whether we call upon him. Or what great nation has statutes and decrees that are just as this whole law, which I am setting before you today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St. James. Dearest brothers and sisters, all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no alteration or shadow caused by change. He will to give us birth by the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruits of his cre creatures. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this to care for orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When the Pharisees, with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed. The purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him. Why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people knows me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. You disregard God's command, but cling to human tradition. He summoned the crowd again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person. The things that come out from within are what defile. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from within and they defile. 
The Gospel of the Lord. So I can respect your email organization system and hope you can respect mine that you do it in batches, you know. Sometimes it's by topic, sometimes it's by mood, sometimes it's by, you know, correspondent. And this week was one of those weeks of, okay, I'm going to separate this batch. won't tell you what was the logic, but this goes over here and this one goes over there. And this is the now heap and this is for later on this morning. And one of the emails that came in was from a guy from Wisconsin, wonderful, wonderful human being by the name of Bill Wambach and his wife, Lorette. I think, I'm pretty sure they share one email address and they're both uh, 93, I think, and their email address is old goats, <laughs> which I think is kind of great, right? And the deal is when you get an email from Bill and or Lorette, but Bill's usually the writer in this situation, it's always something you're glad you heard, right? It's always, it's not like a dumb joke that comes off the internet. It's some little tale of life, something that they observed, something where they went, or just some good thing that you're glad you heard. It's always good news. But recently from this parish, my old parish in Wisconsin, there's been a whole bunch of bad news about people getting sick and a couple of people going through a really rough time and Bill Rebholtz died, and then Ron Dahman died, and then it was just, you know, wonderful, wonderful people, people going through a lot, other people going through challenges and whatnot. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll hold on to Bill's later, even though something tells me, you know, his email is always of the happy sort. And I thought, no, I got to deal with the difficult ones later this morning. <laughs> so later this morning rolls around, and I open up Old Goat's email, Thinking, oh, what's it going to be? Is it going to be more bad news from Wisconsin? Well, of course it wasn't. It was true Bill Wambach. It was always something good and glad and happy that you heard it, right? And this one was the confession that he had just won a gold medal. At 93, you might wonder, what kind of gold medal do you win at 93, other than being the oldest guy at the party? Not him. He was really conflicted about whether he should have accepted this gold medal because for the first time in his long career, he was the only guy in the contest. What was the contest? High jumping. This is true. In this year, in that part of the world, in the age category of 90 to 95 year olds, believe it or not, there was only one high jumper in the whole group, huh? And he was it. But get this, he cleared four feet. I don't know about you, I think about tossing my tired self over a, like a four foot fence, never touching it, that's, that's a tall order, right? That's a really tall order. And then he went on to mention how just two weeks ago, he and Lorette had celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. And I, something about it tells me that they celebrated it in a big picnic at the top of a hill and they all climbed up this mountain. But if it's Wisconsin, it can't be too high a mountain. But always good news. Why do I ever doubt that he's going to send an email with good news in it? And the news of him overcoming that hurdle, <laughs> that, that particular good news, and both of those things, but wanting to hear from him or not wanting to hear from him in that particular moment. It's the story in the readings today about do we really want to hear from God or not? Do we trust well enough to know that whenever God speaks, it's going to be an invitation to deeper peace. That's all that God does. That's all God does is invite us into deeper peace. So why do we hesitate? Why is it that we're not willing all the time to, to ask the question, God, help me to know what you want and want what you want and do what you want? Well, because we're human beings, and we're going to be human beings, and we're always going to be human beings. For all of eternity, we're going to be human beings. But on this side of the pearly gates, we have some challenges. And one of them is, you know, getting, checking in with ourselves about, do I truly believe that whenever it's God speaking, it's an invitation to peace? Or do I let the darker angels prevail and persuade me not to really seek God's hopes? The readings today give us three of those things that, well, they're worth considering as things that are little bits of obstacles in our way and things perhaps which probably we've overcome in our efforts. In those moments when we really want to check in, God, what do you want? Well, don't tell me. I'm not yet, not yet, yeah, yet. Right. First reading today comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, that is Moses' big farewell speech he gives it after at the end of the 40 years and he's on the east side of the Jordan River and the people are about to cross into the west side of the Jordan River into the land flowing with milk and honey the promised land and all of this big book of Deuteronomy this big going away speech is 
Listen, folks, I'm not going with you, but here's what you need to keep in mind. Deuteronomy is really three speeches. There's a short one in the start. There's a great big one, like 20 chapters long in the middle, and then there's a third speech at the end. Today we hear from that first speech. Keep your eye on the ball. It breaks into two parts. Chapters 1 to 3 of Deuteronomy look back on the exile itself. Chapter 4 looks ahead to going into Israel. That's where we hear today. Now what Moses tells the people as they're getting ready to head over the river and into the promised land of flowing with milk and honey is, listen, observe whatever God tells you. Listen to God. Listen to God. Because if you listen to God, then you will enter the land the Lord has prepared for you, and you will be at peace, and you will be in connection with each other and with God, and you will occupy the land and have descendants. Remember that, folks. Keep in mind what God is saying. Keep asking, Lord, what do you want us to do? Help us to know what you want, to want what you want, to do what you want while we occupy the land that we call the promised land. Not really earth-shattering news, except when we look back on chapter 1, verse 26, when Moses is describing the movement up from Egypt, and he says to the people, remember, there came a time when you started asking the craziest question. And that question was, did the Lord drag us out here to torture us, to punish us, to kill us? You had that moment of extraordinary doubt, that moment of extraordinary doubt, when you doubted that God's only desire for you is deeper peace, right? And when you start to doubt that the Lord asks you to step into deeper peace, then you're, you're not going to pay attention to the Lord. And when you stop paying attention to the Lord, then you start to make harebrained choices, and you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot every single time. So don't, don't fall into that trap again. Keep asking, yeah, Lord, what do you want? Trusting the Lord only wants your peace. Don't let doubt get in the way. Don't doubt God's desires for you. The second challenge to us really wanting to listen to God comes from the gospel today. It's called routine. Routines that we make sacred, yeah. Today's gospel, the first part, talks about tradition probably, I think, six times. It uses some form of the word tradition. And we know that tradition is a gift to us. Our tradition lifts us up. Our tradition sets us forth. And our tradition, if we get too carried away, becomes a tool of the dark side. Because we start to, we start to canonize the routine for its own sake, right? And we don't even ask why. And that's what Jesus is talking about with the rituals that the people are observing. They're getting a little bit too carried away. They never stop to think. And so because Jesus is asking them to in, in accept a new way, their, their basic response is, no, 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 we can't deviate from the old routine. they got to hang on to it with both fists as tight as they can. And because of that, they can't even start to listen to the possibility that God is calling them to a new way of relating to one another, a new way of praying, a new way of serving, a new way of building the community. And they don't even know why they're doing these things. They're just doing them. There's a great piece in today's bulletin Dorothy Giron wrote about how these rules got going. And they're real, they make good sense, but then they become a golden calf. And they don't know why, but they won't change. That old story that Dorothy used to tell, speaking of Dorothy Giron, about the, the guy who, when he was first married, he would cook the dinner on Saturday nights and he always cut the last two inches off the roast before he put it in the oven. And he's, his wife said, why do you always cut the last two inches off either end of the roast before you put it in the oven? He said, well, that's because that's of the way we always did it. And then he asks his mother, and he asks his grandmother. His grandmother said, well, the reason we got started in that tradition because we didn't have a pan big enough for the roast, so we had to cut off the two inches on either end, right? Right? So you get into these routines, you don't question, no, but you can't change it. You know, cut the roast, boom, boom. Sometimes we don't want to listen to God's voice because God's maybe going to invite us to change the routine, whether it's work or in a way, particular way of relating to others in relationship or prayer or service or community, you name it. And the third thing that sometimes gets in the way, pointed out in today's gospel, is Jesus saying, well, hold on a second. Be careful about following your gut instincts because sometimes you're so convinced of your own rightness and that your guts are telling you to do this thing but they don't leave much room for God. And so Jesus, at the end of today's gospel, lists the 12 big sins that can really break up a community faster than anything else. And sometimes our guts are telling us to do that because they're a source of immediate gratification, right? 
go through the list. This is a, you know, this is a PG audience. We're not going to repeat each last one of them. But go through that list and look. Every one of those things promises short-term benefits, short-term satisfaction. And each one of them promises to drive you further away from true peace. There's no question about it. Talk to anybody who's ever gone down one of those 12 roads, and they'll tell you it does not lead to peace. It leads to something else. But you do it, we do it, subspecies bonum, as the saints would say, because it looks like a good idea at the time, but it's not. Sometimes it's we doubt God's real desire for us, which is nothing but our pure peace. Sometimes our routines keep us from saying, God, help me to know what you really want, because I don't want to change, man. It seems the situation works. Sometimes it's we listen to our guts, and our guts aren't that good. So, friends, this isn't about, like, yeah, let's, okay, let's, let's all bang ourselves on the head for punishment for doing the wrong thing. No, we're human beings, good, better, best. Never let them rest till your good is like your better and your better best, right? Always taking that next step. And I ask you to notice where you took the last step. A time when you reach one of those intersections in life, you know? Not a even, that doesn't have to be a major, major intersection, but something more important than, you know, what color socks to wear on the first day of school. If we had to make a choice about the company you keep, about the profession you're going to pursue, about where you're going to live, about how you're going to work out this relationship, about how much money you're going to spend, about how much money you're going to budget, about where to go for vacation. One of those things that, you know, there's a lot to consider. And maybe one of those things got in the way. So you didn't really want to check in with God. And then you did. Right? A time when you thought you really want, yeah, maybe I really want God's advice, but looking back you can think, ah, I wasn't really too keen on that. And then you really opened up your heart. And you trusted that, no, God's only going to call me to something good. I don't have to fear God's, God's input on this. God's only calling me to peace. Come on, God, let it roll. I don't have to be too, too addicted to my routine. It can change, and God will be with me after the change. Okay, Lord, so tell me, do you want me to change my routine and my way of life right now? Okay, tell me. I can handle it because you're here. Or maybe it's, Lord, help me not to react right from the guts. Help me to check in with you, and you did. It's like Bill Wambach, right? You're not going to, most of us probably won't win the medal for high jumping at age 93. Not that many people do, huh? But we will be building a high jump pit out here um, so everybody can start to practice during the picnic. But you have overcome those things. You have put aside those things that make you maybe not want to listen so much to God, not check in and see, what's Jesus hoping for right now? What's Jesus want from me? Jesus, let me know what's going on and, and let me follow. And let me not worry about uh, what you're up to. And let me not cling too tightly to my routine. And Lord, let me pay more attention to you than to my guts. You've done that. When have you cleared the hurdle? When have you really overcome that resistance to God's voice? When the Lord says, Ephatha, and at first you resisted, and then you said yes. What's your story? Because we're all human beings, and I'm pretty sure we all are human beings, <laughs> we are all going to have these things that get in the way of us listening to God. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Wait, I don't know if I should really listen to that because maybe God doesn't really want what's best for me. Wow. Flag on the play. And so we all get these hurdles that we have to overcome. Sometimes it's about doubting whether what God wants is really an act of love. Sometimes it's because our routines become sort of sacred, and sometimes it's because we want to follow our guts and put Jesus on hold and then come back to Jesus later. So you faced those situations. I'd ask you to notice one. It's not about your next step. It's about your last step. When God offered you the grace to get over it, to really sincerely want what God wants, and you rose to the occasion, you jumped over the hurdle. You did it, man. You won the medal. You've done it. When have you done it? really decided deliberately to put God's hopes in front of yours, and you did it. When? Ephatha. Let us pray. 